Thanks for checking out this video. Don't forget, like and subscribe. It says the end of his run in AEW was, quote, terrible. He was on with Chris v uh, Van Vliet. He admitted his time there did not end well. There were petty squabbles that went on behind the scenes. How AEW ended was terrible, really. People are going to write books later on. These stories are going to get out there. It's going to be a whole new ball game. He says there is a piece of this that's really important to certain fans from the AW fandom. They need the story to be that they didn't want me. They pushed me out. They need he was bad. They need that story. They need me to be the villain. I was always fine with accepting that because of the respect I have for AW in the first place. How difficult it was to do the original All In. How unbelievable the feeling was to do Double or Nothing. How fortunate we were that Tony wanted to invest in this vision. And he had a vision. Regardless of any petty squabbles, I always have a love for it. Got to wrestle Brody Lee's final match. Got to lead people, young people behind the scenes. I will always have a lot of love for it. So yeah, there were uh, a lot of rumors. Uh, a lot of rumors about the final days of of Cody and AEW. And a lot of talk about him not getting along with all the rest of the EVPs and etc. And uh, he did say... Uh, he did not like a section of the Young Bucks memoir that stated that he was the last one to sign with AEW. I hated it in the Young Bucks book. They said I was last to the signing because that's a big thing. Some of the AEW defenders, they don't realize they're turning people off to their product more than they're turning people on. So one of the things people always cite, oh, he was last. He wasn't that big a deal to the origin. No, this guy here who's off camera was the first person to ever meet Tony. And he met him in a vetting process for all of us. So, yes, I guess I was the last, and yes, I had different thoughts. It's not incorrect at all what they said. It's not incorrect, but I was just as in on it as everybody else. So, I mean, all I can tell you is that, you know, there were a lot of rumors at the end about Cody and the other EVPs not getting along and having a lot of issues and everything like that. And, you know, he's admitting that there were, there were issues at times. But, you know, he said... And I, I had other people tell me this, that, you know, after he left, you know, by the end of there, everybody was on good terms. And they're all on really good terms today. And, you know, the early, early period, there were growing pains. But, uh, you know, he didn't leave because of issues with the EVPs. And apparently, you know, he's talked about how I'm never going to really talk about why I left. You know, that's between me and Tony. And we probably will never know. But I'm pretty sure it's true there will be many books written about the first five years of AEW. And uh, they'll be pretty interesting when they come out. Yeah, interesting comments from him. You know, I kind of thought maybe that was a little bit overblown about people questioning his loyalty to AEW or people questioning different things about it. And then I looked in the comments of some of the people who posted those that story and... Yeah, I guess there are people that took it out on Cody Rhodes or takes things out on Cody Rhodes. And, you know, one thing it does is reopens the door for debate, though, because every time he brings this up, it's going to lead to people asking, OK, well, why'd you leave? Because he has been secretive about it. And apparently there is an NDA or whatever it is. And I can understand there being an NDA from some point because... He helped start the company, trade secrets, all that sort of stuff. But for people who are just on the borderline of this, well, they hear that and now they may want to know more and it just opens up more debate. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VV also of WrestlingObserver.com. Big question over the next few days is how wrestling is going to do with the home run derby and such. Do you because, watch? Yeah. Because last week... <laughs> Last week, the shows actually did really well. The Rampage show did uh, 339,000 viewers in a point twelve, which was their best numbers in months. SmackDown show did 2.4 million. But of course, we can't round up 2.355 and a point seven zero, which was their biggest numbers in months. And then the uh, Collision show... Ended up doing, uh, I mean, the Collision Show was interesting because the show itself did uh, 362000 in a .14, which was way up from the week prior because the week prior was going head-to-head -head with, like, that WWE pay-per-view and got murdered. But um, the 362 and 
when you think about the fact that it was going up against all of the live coverage of the attempted assassination of Donald Trump, the collision show finished 24th because, like, I don't know, I think there was a UFC fight night that, that did was. better. There was. But, I mean, other than that, like, 22 of the top 24 shows were coverage of 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 the Trump deal, which broke at uh, 611 Eastern, according to uh, WrestleNomics here. So, you know, given, you know, all of the other competition, I mean, that's a pretty good number. So very good numbers for uh, wrestling over the last, uh, or at least last week. Now we have to wait and see uh, how Raw does yesterday. We shall see. I didn't go back and look it up, but I believe the home run derby really hurts them with younger people. Obviously, you're your 12 to 18s or however they do that under you know under 18 uh group that usually gets hurt and they usually get hurt a little bit across the board with that sort of stuff because it's the home run derby but it shouldn't be down too much considering what they have going on right now and considering that Rhea Ripley was at the beginning of that show it's just going to be one of those things I think it's going to average out to be pretty close to what it usually does there just may be some bigger dips at times and uh, I don't know how it timed up as well too it did go pretty long with uh, Teoscar Hernandez and Bobby Wood Jr. they're going to a hit off Rick Flair did a bunch of interviews over the last couple of days he says he'd have no problem with John Cena breaking his world title record well that's good brother you ain't got a you ain't got a say in this one. It's totally real. He said, "I I think so much personally of John Cena. He's one of those really great guys, and I've known a few." He said. So uh, he drink with him on the bus. See, here's the thing with with the Flair record. The Flair record is is which one? It's fake. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Flair's actual number of title wins. You know, Flair's title reminds me of his title wins. 24 7 title because i was looking at the uh i was looking at the title history of the 24 7 title and they got like four title changes unrecognized why i have no idea but anyway technicalities flair's flair's been the world champion about 22 times realistically like the number of times he actually won it and then, you know, they they made up numbers. They didn't count certain title changes. They didn't report yes. certain title changes. They, you know. So anyway, the the uh, the official number, the official number according to WWE is 16. But like if if John Cena wins 17, then WWE will promote him, which they have been already as the greatest of all time. So you may as well give him that title. Uh but, I mean, he's still not going to ever have as many world titles as Flair did. And it doesn't matter, but that's that's the story. I was going to say, how many times did Flair have it at a time in WCW towards the end when they were complete garbage, you know, and they just hot potatoed the thing around because, you know, prop bro. It will be interesting to see how long it takes before John Cena breaks that record as he retires, uh, his retirement tour goes, if he, if and when he breaks it, and then if and when Charlotte Flair comes back and breaks John Cena's record for breaking her father's record. You know, I don't, I don't see that happening, really. I don't anymore either, but it was always one of those things that a lot of people believe were out there, and I think there were probably some people in WWE that had eyes on it, too. You know, the thing with John Cena is we have we have two titles. We have the WWE title. We have the world title. I mean, the world title is the secondary title, but I don't see any issue with him winning that title one more time in his final run. And honestly, you know, I, I you know, people like to say there's no reactionary booking between AEW and WWE, but of course there is. And I, I do think that I don't think that John Cena is going to win the title and retire with it like Sting. But I do think that they very much have seen the retirement of Sting and how successful it was, and they want to do something similar in the well, sense that... Well, he could face The Rock for The Rock's title that The Rock gave himself. That's, by way that of, doesn't count. By way of Muhammad Ali, apparently it matters to The Rock. Well, that's you know, fine, you, it can matter that if you want. And no, the, the, here's another thing, too, and I hope this doesn't happen, but they leave it open because of how they announce Cody Rhodes as the undisputed WWE champion. What is he undisputed for? 
Oh, wait, the Universal title still technically is floating out there in the ether if they want to go ahead and bring that back as well. So that's always possible, too, even though I hate that idea. I would be surprised. I hate it. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that notify button, and you'll never miss a video again.